action over the next 30 minutes. But first, let's get started with the big interview from the auto sector. Maruti Suzuki's chairman, R.C. Bhargava, has said that the company's inventory is not in excess. Speaking to my colleague, Parishit Luthra, R.C. Bhargava added that while various factors have affected car sales this year, he was hopeful that Maruti Suzuki's sales will see an uptick with a new model launch in the fourth quarter. Here's an excerpt of that interaction. The month of November, the sales were down. Uh, the production was down by 20% as well for passenger vehicles. Current inventory levels, if we speak to dealers, dealers associations in the country, they're saying we have about six to eight weeks of inventory. Isn't that a worrying sign? As far as Maruti is concerned, the inventory level is about four weeks, one month, which is our, what we prescribe as the correct level. It's true in the past couple of years, dealers have got used to much lower inventory levels. Mm. And so in that sense, they have more. Mm. But we are not uh, eight weeks kind of inventory. Mm. Production cuts have been made by people to adjust inventory. Yeah. There's no point producing when there's already enough in the pipeline and with the dealers. Mm. That's not uh, uh, anything because that's just a reflection of what's happening in the market. What's the reason for the drop in sales as well? There have been drop in numbers for Maruti as well as the entire overall, industry. Overall, if I look at the year, we haven't dropped. We are still grow we have a good growth, about 8% growth that still exists. But that growth was largely in the first quarter. Mm. Subsequently, I think the fact that no new model was launched by us this year mm. has been uh, obviously a negative factor. Mm. Because in the past, Growth has always been driven by new launches. Mm. If you look at amongst different companies also, mm. companies which launched new models mm. have had a growth. Mm. Companies which didn't launch new models have declined. Mm. Mm. And the same thing is happening to industry this year. Mm. In addition to this, uh, the petrol diesel prices have not helped at all. Mm. The insurance uh, requirement for three years advance payment mm. has also not helped. Mm. And that this is a pre-election year mm. also doesn't seem to be favorable for car sales if I look at what happened in 2013 and 2008. Mm. Moving on, the Niti Aayog has released a report titled Strategy for a New India at 75. The report sets goals for economic growth across various sectors for the country in the 75th year of independence in 2022. Here are the highlights. The strategy outlines an average growth rate of 8% till 2022 and hopes to make India a $4 trillion economy. The report also sets out some ambitious macroeconomic targets to put India on the high growth path. Gross fixed capital formation, which is a measure of the investment rate, is currently at 29% of GDP. The report expects this to hit 36% in five years' time. India currently exports just under $500 billion of goods and services. The report expects this to hit $800 billion. The tax-to-GDP ratio is currently at 17% and the report expects this to reach at least 22%. The report also lays out ways in which income from agriculture can be doubled in the next five years, from increasing irrigation coverage to hybrid seeds to public-private partnerships. It spells out various steps to boost agricultural productivity. Here is Niti Aayog's Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar on the new strategy report. It's not a conservative approach at all. I think because we're talking about an average of 8% over the next five years. And, you know, as for example, and this year is included in that, and you'll get about seven and a bit in this year. And so, therefore, growth in the terminal year would have to rise towards double digit to get you an average of eight. Going by the current distress in the farm sector, how realistic is it, do you think, will be, will be to, 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 you know, aspire for such a level? And secondly, you know, what, what uh, sustainable measures can we see as far as intervention on the farm sector? Loan waiver, as, we, as many economists like you agree, is not a sustainable solution. You know, this is why the strategy talk about, talk about creating agripreneurs. You know, and I think that's a very important word. And, you know, I, I hope the... Uh, importance is not missed because that implies the creation of agro processing industry at a much faster pace than what you have had so far and the value addition in agriculture and with the farmer participating in it like for example in some cases the FPO etc mm -hmm. some FPOs has been done is the way forward for farmers income to double not through raising agricultural output that's one part of it 
The second part of it is, of course, that you want to reduce the costs of production. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the, the cycle of rising costs and rising MSPs and, you know, therefore rising indebtedness very often is also not the way forward. Mm -hmm. So this is why, if you notice, uh, we have been a little uh, bold in saying that we will look at zero budget natural farming in a very s systematic way. Now, the Niti Aayog Vice Chairman also said that they are concerned about the employment situation in India, but he stopped short of calling it a crisis. On the, on the employment front, uh, uh, the question, uh, I'm not sure the word crisis is, uh, is, is uh, the appropriate word to use. Uh, we are concerned with the employment situation. We've always been. In fact, I've been one of those economists who has said that our uh, policy targets could well be in terms of employment maximization and the growth will come out of that uh, because there is, you know, that, that's what we need today given our young population. All right, let's get started with the market action as well. Markets continued their up move for seventh consecutive session today to end at three months high. So Nifty ended with gains of about half a percent and the index is now within kissing distance of the 11,000 mark. Sensex rallied about two-fifths of a percent by the end of the day. Banks saw an up move of about half a percent, while mid-caps outperformed today to end with gains of more than a percent. Prashant Nair is joining in now to give us a detailed check of the market action. Prashant, looks like bulls are clearly reclaiming all lost ground. By close, the market wasn't at the day's high. I mean, at the day's highest point, the Nifty was up uh, almost uh, 75 points or so, uh, and uh, we were down to being up about 50 points uh, by close. But still, I mean, you know, on all parameters, it was a good session, especially given the fact that uh, the market has already done so much from the recent lows of about 10,300, just six or seven trading sessions back. Uh, so no complaints whatsoever. The broader market especially did very well. Mid-cap and small-cap indices. I mean, actually, the small-cap index ended at the day's highest point, And the mid-cap index from the day high did not lose as much as the Nifty or, for example, the Bank Nifty did. Uh, let's start with sectors. Real estate, public sector banks and infrastructure. These are the three areas where there was there were maximum gains as, as pockets. As far as Nifty gainers are concerned, India Bulls Housing, top of the list really. Bajaj Finance, lots of financials you will find in the commentary today. Uh, as I said, Bajaj Finance, Bajaj Finser, there was Axis Bank, uh, and of course, there was uh, the crude beneficiaries. Pain companies like Asian Pains and BPCL was also one of the top Nifty gainer. PSU banks, I mean, uh, uh, gained and uh, did very, very well. There was, of course, SBI, the large PSU, the largest uh, name there, which did well, but there were others. Vijaya Bank, Bank of India, Central Bank, there was Syndicate Bank, Dana Bank, Corporation Bank. I mean, actually, I don't think there was a single public set of bank which actually ended the day in the negative territory. And in that same way, NBFCs were the flavor of the day, really. So, uh, Muthut Capital, Sriram Transport, l &T Finance, Chola Finance, uh, you know, a broker NBFCs like Motila Loswal, Edelweiss, uh, all did very, very well. As I began by saying, the breadth of the market was firmly in favor of advances. And uh, what I think makes this uh, even better is that from the recent close, not that far back, and given the adverse news flow that we've had, uh, the market is up uh, a cool six, 650 or points already. Well, the ghost of the angel tax is back to haunt the startup ecosystem. Over the past few days, there have been reports of several early stage startups receiving notices from the income tax department asking them to clear outstanding dues on the angel funding received by them. Now, this despite the government's previous assurance, the Central Board of Direct Taxation had issued a circular in February assuring startups that no coercive measures would be taken to recover outstanding angel tax demands. Later on in May, the government declared that no angel tax will be levied to up to 10 crore rupees of funding raised by a startup. So once again, for the benefit of all of our viewers, what exactly is the angel tax? It is the tax that the startup pays on the investment recovered from an external investor above its fair market valuation. Now that's where the problem lies. How do you determine fair market valuation? Startups consider this a deterrent to the spirit of entrepreneurship. Industry leaders like Mohandas Pai, Kiran Mazumdar, Shohan and Mahindra have already raised their objections to the tax notices issued. So joining me now on the show, three special Special guest, Mohan Das Pai, Chairman of the Manipal Global Education Services, a startup investor himself. Uh, he's also the Chairman of Aaron Capital. Also with us, Srijit Mulel, co-founder of True Elements, uh, Abe Zakaria, co-founder and CEO of Goodbox, and Raj Rajesh Sani, founder of GSF Accelerator and co-founder of Healthy, also with us. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on the program. Mohan Das Pai, this is almost deja vu. I remember that uh, during the month of April, we had discussed this ad nauseum, the, the ghost of the 
angel tax returns to haunt the Indian startup ecosystem. What's going on? What is going on is the income tax department is out of control. They're not listening to the CBTV guidelines. They're not going by what government has promised the taxpayers. There is no concept of taxpayer service. And they've gone totally abroad, a war board. Let me give you an example. For example, a venture capital fund has been asked to come to Varanasi to explain why they invested in a company at that valuation, whereas the law clearly uh, stipulates that any venture capital fund registered with uh, SEBI will not be asked this question. Then one income tax officer, some few income tax officers mm. have uh, you know, taken the difference between the projection and the actual achievement and the difference between valuation and added that to income to say, you gave a projection, you didn't see the projection, you've done less, now the difference is what you have to pay as tax. Mm. And they're using coercive action to pay 20%. This is totally absurd because the government of India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi promised that there'll be a very, there'll be ease of doing business and everything. And last year, Sishirin, after... Yeah, but what's Europe the point program, of these promises, Mr. Pai? No, no, but that's yes, my point. That's my point. We I have done a sustained campaign. You were on yes. that program. What's the yes. point of these promises if they translate into this on the ground? Shirin, I want to ask Prime Minister Narendra Modi as to who runs this country. Our Prime Minister runs this country. Now, the tax officers are beyond control of anybody. The Prime Minister's office, the DIPP, and everybody, Finance Ministry, asked the CBT take action. CBT calls some of us, we explain, and they promised to do it. Now, we see all this happening on a much wider scale than last time. And assessment orders have been passed, people have been mm. put in trouble, and it's gone beyond control. This is tax terrorism at the worst. I want to ask mm. our finance minister publicly that he promised us tax terrorism will be brought down when he, when he came to power in 2014. What has been done? It is four and a half years. It's time that our representative took charge of this country and didn't allow all these people to go overboard to harass young people, harass citizens. We are suffering from tax terrorism. This is an extreme example. where circulars are not being listened to, not being obeyed. I think this is very, very serious, Shirin. It cannot go on like this. Uh, you're right that this is serious uh, and uh, we have seen assurances in the past but clearly what we're seeing today is a return of exactly the very same issues. Let me bring in Srijit Mulyal into this conversation. Srijit, as I pointed out, we've been discussing this issue. We brought it to the attention of the authorities several months ago and yet it returns. Uh, do you agree with Mr. Mohandas Pai that uh, this time around the action is far worse? In fact, to quote Mr. Pai, he says the action is far more perverse than the last time on part of the Income Tax Department. I would completely agree with Mr. Pai because there is a huge gap between what the leadership wants and what bureaucracy is doing. Now, last year, when we were discussing the same topic and I had an order last time. This year, I am waiting next order for my subsequent round. But the number of orders which have been issued in the last two, three weeks is exponentially high. What we doubt is probably startups are an easy target for... Uh, and uh, income tax officers to meet their target because one startup million you have raised one and a half two crore in angel uh, in, uh, round and you can issue an order of 40 lakhs. That's what is been happening. So there is no change except that there is a clarity or an alternative process which is very cumbersome, complex process of IMD approval for people who are going to raise fund again. That's not a solution. Well, I myself have applied in IMD almost four months back. Nothing has moved. I applied under, uh, I mean, for against my order uh, with an appeal uh, last year. Nothing has moved. So there is better clarity, but execution is there is nothing has changed since last one year. Okay, you haven't seen any forward movement since the last one year, which is when you received your income tax notice. Rajesh Sani, let me come to you. You run the GSF Accelerator. You deal with the uh, uh, startups as well. What is the experience uh, that you're facing with respect to the angel tax? Hey, Shireen, I think there are three key issues. One is the valuation. As Mohandas also said, I don't think income tax officers are capable of valuing uh, any startup. In fact, that's the only valuation method that they understand or want to understand is DCF. And DCF clearly doesn't work when you yeah. want to, uh, you know, value a startup. Many of the startups may not even have any revenue for many years and still may be valuable. So this mm. goes against the basic premise of uh, how, the fund, how the startups are funded by angels. So that is creating a lot of friction. And then... The second issue is they are targeting. 
I think they are systematically targeting the startups. Mm. This is both arbitrary and indiscriminate. Mm. And none of the startups okay. has been but spared. Is there, can we put some numbers on this? Rajesh Sani, I mean, I want for, for the benefit of all of our viewers, uh, again, uh, the point that Rajesh is making there on the discounted cash flow, the DCF method, which doesn't take into account intangibles like IP, market potential, etc. Uh, Rajesh Sani's argument is that that is something that the tax department uh, is used to and uh, this is not how startups uh, are valued uh, necessarily and that's causing a point of friction. But do we have some data? How many income tax notices have been sent out? How many penalty notices have been sent out? Rajesh, do you have any anecdotal information as well uh, on what is the quantum of this problem? I think at hundreds. In fact, I have uh, seen in my portfolio 10 to 15 companies that are dealing with these issues. And it's essentially for the companies that those were registered between in 2015 and 16. So I think there is some kind of targeting of those companies. Almost every startup that was registered in that time period and has raised some money has been sent a notice. And they are now dealing with income tax officers. Okay. Out of 14, one okay, of and what has been the response? Have, have you tried to... Sorry, what were you saying, Mr. Pai? See, out of 14 in 40, 40 startups in one of our funds, 10 have got notices this year. And uh, some, of them have, uh, some of them have been really harassed. Ten have got notices. That is 25% out of a portfolio of 40. And, uh, and uh, we got uh, about 25 notices from other people. I mean, another 15 notices from other people who have come, who are all our friends and sisters who are asking for help. So we got mm. about 25 particular cases mm. of notices and some assessment orders which have been uh, passed. Assessment orders which have been passed also we have got. Okay, so about 25 out of your own portfolio companies have been given uh, notices yeah. of one kind or the other. Let me go across to Abby Zachariah of Good Box as well. Abby, what exactly is the problem that you're faced with? I believe that you've been slapped with a penalty as well. Yeah, so basically we had raised uh, a small angel round uh, from two, of two very well-known entrepreneurs. I don't want to name them right now. Uh, amounting to about 60 lakhs. So on that, we got a tax of about 24 lakhs, including the interest, etc., as we slammed on us. Uh, this is like for the recent one. Okay. Yeah. But uh, we will work around on that in, the, in terms of the appeals, etc., and we may have some set of, of the losses to be done. But the whole process is like very cumbersome and totally uncalled for. Because if you look at the background of these investors who have put money, the source of fund comes from uh, well-known startup exits okay and uh, we are ourselves yeah. are a fully compliant company no cash payouts audited by Deloitte and you know uh, we have to uh, go through this whole with my role because there's a bunch of guys who may be doing money laundering right so that is where our problem is and now for the last two three days now it's very disturbing and instead of uh, looking at our business we tend to you know worry about this okay all right, so that's the problem that you're faced with. But Mr. Pai, let's go back to what uh, we should realistically now expect and what is the want or the ask from the government. You said that what was announced last time, there were two circulars, uh, one from the DIPP, one from the CBDT, which basically said that there should be no coercive action. You believe that that was a quick fix, it was a short-term fix, but something more permanent is needed. Now, what is that solution that you want the government to take forward? Well, the solution that we want the government to take forward is if there is a valuation by a chartered accountant or a merchant banker, that valuation should be accepted. The income tax officer should not question it because he has no competence to question it because that is a valuation certificate given. That's point number one. Point number two, the plan details of every investor is given in the tax returns. They ask for it. Everybody has been given. Now, they can go check up the plan from the database because all filing is electronic and check up and see is there any person who has invested a certain amount and if you look at his income tax record for last three, four years, the database, does he have the income to invest? They have a right to invest, yeah. they should do it. And only for those people where they feel yeah. that uh, you know, they don't have the correct income, they can send a notice to the investor to say, why didn't you explain your investment? Because there's something called the AIR return for mutual funds, but right. they must do. But what they do is they send a notice to a startup and say, give me a list of all your investors, give me a list of all the plans, give me their income tax return for last three years, give me the balance between the last three years. Now, bank statements and balance sheets and income mm. return of all the investors is confidential. 
We are given the pan. The pan is there in the database. Ah. Let them make the search. They're not making the search. They're asking the startup to give. Then they give the startup five days, six days. It's not enough to get any details. Then they say, give the hmm. thing. We don't give it. We'll have coercive action. And there is panic. So they, ha they have, see, let us accept. They have a right to ask for source of money. That is the law. Let them ask for source of money. And the next thing is, wherever funds are invested, the law is that the violation is done by a SEBI registered fund. They must not ask questions. Now they're asking the funds to come and explain yeah. why this is happening. So the solution is very clear. CBT is issue circulars. The law is also clear. But they're not applying the law. They're judging themselves mm. and arrogating themselves mm. the right to do everything which is wrong. Because if professionals are given a certificate, you accept the certificate, that is the law. And you can ask people for sources. That is your prerogative. Yeah. But instead of that, you go out mm. to the startup. Mm. And another thing, another thing, Shireen, in India, our assessment system is broken because there is rampant tax terrorism. I'm putting it on record. I've been saying for five years. And mm. our appeal system is broken. Now he issues the thing. They force people to pay. Mm. It goes in appeal. By the time the commissioner will definitely side with revenue because 80, 85 percent, they always side with revenue. Then you go to the tribunal. Tribunal takes three years. Then they go to the high court. High court takes yeah. five years. The yeah. Supreme Court takes 10 to 15 years. You can't have a country with a broken assessment system right. and a broken appeal system. If you fix one of them, then okay. fine. There can be okay. some fight. Now there is no hope. Okay, tax terrorism of the worst sort, an assessment system that's broken and an appeal system that's broken as well. Rajesh Sani, final word to you. Is there a crisis of confidence in the startup ecosystem today? Totally. I think more than uh, not just the startups, I think there's a crisis of confidence in angel investors. Uh, no one wants to be harassed for uh, angel investing is the riskiest asset class. And I think that's also getting broken in as well with this process. All Only right, as we pointed out uh, uh, to our Shireen, viewers, that this is, yeah, Shireen, yes, yes. Shireen, what, look at the tragedy, Shirin. Only 10% of the total investment of $13.7 billion come from India. Now, you're driving away the angel investors, you're driving away individuals. Who is going to invest? All the startups are going to be owned by foreign capital. Out of the 26 unicorns, 22, I think, mm. are domiciled outside India. Out of the 31 sunicorns, great majority domicile outside India. We are becoming a digital colony, and the income mm. tax officer are helping us become a digital colony with Indians not investing. And if they invest, they get harassed. It's much better to stay outside India and in Singapore register. They get the money there and invest in India, and you're safe. What kind of a country is this, Shirin? What kind of a system is this where you discriminate against your own investors, you harass Mr. your own people, you terrorize Mr. your own Pai, people? Mr. Pai, you have, you have the years. You have the years of the government, sir. You're saying this. I mean, you know, it, it, that, yes. that really speaks volumes that you're saying what kind of yes. a country is this for startups? Yes, absolutely. We have worked hard for the startup the last four years. <laughs> Prime Minister Modi has given a fantastic policy. He created the 10,000 crore, but he has done everything else. But the finance ministry has not done his bit, and the CBTD is not able to enforce his writ on the officers. When the CBTD cannot enforce his writ. What is the hope for this country? The finance ministry should come in. Suresh Prabhu should come in immediately. They have innumerable meetings. Amitabh Kant should. Well, Amitabh Kant, I spoke to him. He said he's going to come in. But they must move fast and stop. First, they must stop this harassment. Stop everything. Tell them don't use coercive action. Don't issue orders. Hmm. We'll sort it out and sort out in the next one week. Only the prime minister can do it. Even well, the founders will want to move. Okay, to so you're calling for the prime. Yes. Yes. Even sorry, uh, uh, Trijit, were you saying something or? App? Even Abby, the founders, yeah. Abby, sorry, what were you saying? I'm saying even the founders will look at starting up in Singapore, right? So it's like a river, brain drain happening of stocks. <laughs> and I know quite a few founders who have set up companies. All right. In all right, uh, founders looking at the option of domiciling outside of India because of the kind of tax harassment that they're faced with. Unanimity on the panel, Mohan Das Pai, Srijit Mulyal, Rajesh Sani, Abhi Zakaria. Appreciate you joining us. As we pointed out, this has been something that we've been taking up on a sustained basis here at CNBC TV 18. And it really seems like deja vu that we're back again talking about exactly the same issue that startups are faced with. We hope someone is listening. The minister, Suresh Prabhu, tweeting saying that uh, we've taken note.